check one, two, three. Hello, this is uh, Mr. Harris, and this is Global Studies 9, Korea International School, Jeju. You've made it grade 9. This is the last section, last chapter, uh, chapter 22, section 2, about the Enlightenment. So I'm going to start off actually with a little question, uh, which I want to give you about 10 seconds to ponder. And the question is, why do laws exist? Now, I'm sure you came up with several reasons why, and um, I want to go over a prominent figure from the Enlightenment period whose uh, ideas are very relevant to why laws exist. So this individual is Beccaria, and um, prior to his philosophy, the general consensus of why laws existed was to avenge crime. So uh, if you remember the Hammurabi Code, you know, you break or you, you blind someone's eye, well, then your eyes are going to be blinded, right? It's a punishment. You murder someone, well, you're going to, you might get murdered or, you know, tortured, right? As a punishment. You steal something, um, thinking back to, you know, Sharia law, you get your hand chopped off. So punishment was the main reason laws exist. Now, Beccaria believed that this is not the case and should not be the case. He believed that instead, laws exist to preserve social order. He believed that by nature, people were rational. And before, because they're rational, if they know the rules and they know that if they break the rules, there would be consequences, they would not break rules, at least for the most part. He was also very much hundreds of years ahead of his time in the sense that he was against things like torture, the death penalty, all things that were very much a regular part of you know, society, the basic part of the fabric of um, any civilization, whether it's European or not, all the way into the 1900s. And um, it's interesting how a lot of his philosophy is still the foundation of Western law today. Now, um, speaking of death penalty and torture, um, torture is pretty much illegal everywhere, but the death penalty is still very much a controversial issue in the world today, where we have over 100 countries that do not allow capital punishment, but we have a good 56 countries where it is legal. Uh, the methodo methodologies... Um, vary. Some are hanging, there's some shooting, some lethal injection, even beheading, I believe, limited to Saudi Arabia. Um, last year, almost 2,000 people were executed, although most of those people were, from, were in China or Iran. Uh, in South Korea, there has been no capital punishment for the past 20 years. In the United States, it's very split. About half the states have execution, capital punishment and the other half do not. Uh, last year, only 20 executions were carried out, which is lower uh, than it was two years ago and three years ago. So focusing a bit on the global perspective, as you can see, and as I mentioned earlier, China and Iran really dominate the capital punishment game. Um, most of the capital punishment, as you can see, are carried out by these two countries. Interesting fact, you'll notice Saudi Arabia is also in there. Um, they have a rather notorious reputation when it comes to the death penalty uh, because of the methods they use. And um, one of the methods they use is beheading. Mm -hmm. All right, next we are going to look at the United States of America. So in the U.S., um, capital punishment is carried out in various states, but the two states that it's carried out the most are in Florida and Texas. Now, a quick question for you, the viewer. Are you for the death penalty? So again, I want to give you about 10, 15 seconds to just think about that. I know some of you probably have an immediate answer. Some of you might have to think about it a bit. So are you for the death penalty, capital punishment? Well, I'm sure some of you probably thought yes, some of you thought no, and this is what we call a subjective question, right? There is no correct answer. So I want to share with you possible reasons why someone may be for and why they may be against capital punishment. So people who are for capital punishment say it would scare future criminals, that it's often the, the type of retribution that the victim's family perhaps is seeking. Um, it's a way to save money, right? If you execute someone, you don't have to pay for their living costs in jail, which can be in a place like the United States as expensive as $70,000, $80,000 a year. And that, you know, it's basically the worst possible punishment one could receive. So those are all arguments for capital punishment. Now, against capital punishment, 
people could argue that it does not deter crime, right? If this was the case, China and Iran, Saudi Arabia would be the safest places in the world. They are not. There's arguments also that simply inhumane. The state should not have the power to take a human life. Another argument is that it's something that you cannot take back. So if you execute someone and then DNA evidence, for example, comes about two years later that exonerates one person of that crime, that person's dead. So you cannot take back the actions that have been committed. Now, I want you to think now again about where you stand in regards to death penalty because this will be a key to our discussion um, after the Columbus Court. You'll come and we'll discuss this issue in greater length. Alright, now moving on to uh, feminism. So um, one of the earliest forms of feminism can be seen in this book called The Serious Proposal to the Ladies, written by Mary Astell which addresses the serious lack of educational opportunities for women. And Astell's view is that, you know, without education, women don't stand a chance against men in the workplace. And that education was where to start feminism. Some of you may be wondering, what is feminism? So I looked for the exact de definition online. And the exact definition is the advocacy of women's rights on basis of the equality of the sexes. So it's not about saying women are better or... You know, men are better, it's about the advocacy of equal rights. Now, um, one of the, or probably one of the most prominent figures of feminism is Mary Wollstonecraft. Very interesting background, she has this abusive father, she goes on to, you know, have a decent career despite these setbacks, she's a translator as well as a writer, and she urged women to join male-dominated fields, whether this be in the sciences or in the maths and um, politics. She found that, you know, women were especially underrepresented in certain areas and that the only way for women to ever gain power and to become equal to men were to, to um, even out of the playing fields in these male-dominated areas. Now, while we're in the topic of feminism, this part's not in the book, but I thought it's worth addressing very quickly. There's con uh, historians consider that there are three waves of uh, feminism. So the first wave is the one we're looking at right now. It's a very simple um, goal. The goal is to be able to vote, right? Because without a vote, you're not going to be able to elect politicians and get that protection you need. So this goes on for over a century. It, it's actually pretty crazy how long it took. And it took, for example, the United States all the way up to 1920. That's less than 100 years ago. Women couldn't even vote. And uh, what a lot of people also forget is in other places that would be considered fairly quote-unquote progressive, for example, Switzerland, uh, they didn't even have women's right, rights to vote until the 1950s. So, um, you know, the concept of being able to vote is actually a very modern one. The second wave takes place from the 1960s up to about the 1990s, and um, now women are able to vote, but they realize that there are still so many obstacles, right? A lot of the discrimination that existed from before women can vote still exists, whether this be the limit women have to their reproductive rights. So do they have access to things like birth control, abortions? Um, are women being treated equally in the workplace? You know, what is a woman's role in the family? Um, you know, is it, does a woman just have to have babies and stay home and, you know, look after the children? Or, it, you know, is there some sort of balance that should be struck? And the third wave is basically trying to finish up what wasn't accomplished in the 1960s, like getting equal pay and getting equal treatment in the workplace. But it also begins to include um, other movements that weren't included before, like transgenders, queers, and the focus is now to you know, help all groups. Whereas in the 60s, a little, there was a little bit more stronger focus on white women. The third wave of feminism is considered to use intersectionality. And, you know, there's a focus on helping out all disenfranchised groups. So that's basically the super condensed version of feminism. Um, I, I know that this is probably gone for an hour, but this is, again, the super short version of three waves of feminism. So an interesting um, movie that came out about two years ago was called Suffragettes. Um, this talks about the story of um, women getting the right to vote in uh, England. And uh, this is a pretty strong scene here, powerful scene of Emily Davison, a suffragette who um, she tries to hold a banner up at this horse race 
and uh, in the process, um, she loses her life. So um, she doesn't die immediately, but based on these um, head injuries she gets here, she dies four days later in a hospital. So yeah, the actual version of it is also available on YouTube. It's a pretty um, insane part of history, and what's crazier is just how recent it is. I mean, we're talking about only about 100 years ago. So we finish off with the legacy of the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment left us with this concept that, you know, progress can happen through scientific breakthroughs, through philosophical breakthroughs that we can, as mankind, you know, progress to the next level. There's also a more secular outlook that, you know, our understanding of the cosmos, of the universe around us, does not have to just come from the church, but it can come from scholars, it can come from scientists. Right? We can look at the world beyond just the lenses of the church. And sort of connected to two is the importance of the individual. So as people began to turn away from the church and look for guidance, they looked at themselves, right? They looked at each other. They noticed that through reason and logic, people can make their lives better. They can find cure to diseases. That, you know, by using our brains and using reason and logic, that human beings can connect, this connects number one, you know, progress to the next level. And that just about concludes chapter 22, section 2, as well as this entire uh, school year. So I understand this flipped classroom was a, it's a nice little experiment. Most likely this is going to be the primary way um, ninth grade will be taught next year. Uh, hopefully this worked out this last few weeks for you. And um, as usual, here are the copyright disclaimers under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarships, and research. Fair use is the use permitted by a copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational personal use. Tips the balance in favor of fair use it is not to be used for copying and selling. No copyright infringement intended. Uh, have an excellent day and goodbye.